Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of everyone at the Center for Brain Health, welcome to Frontiers of Brain Health, a talk series where we take a deep dive into the most exciting developments in brain research. I'm Dan Krawczyk. I'm the Deputy Director at the Center for Brain Health and also a faculty member in psychology at Behavioral and Brain Science in, uh, the, in UT Dallas. I wanted to mention before we get started that we will have an opportunity for Q&A. Uh, so if you uh, have a burning question during the talk, go ahead and type it into the Q&A section um, in Teams, and we will get to as many of those as we can, time permitting, at the end of the talk. This presentation is also being recorded and will be available at the Center YouTube channel. The Center for Brain Health is a cognitive neuroscience focused research center. We're a part of the University of Texas at Dallas, and we've dedicated the past three decades to exploring neural plasticity and the brain's amazing lifelong potential to get stronger and function more effectively. Now, today we have a new face at UT Dallas, a new assistant professor in psychology in the School of Behavioral and Brain Science, Dr. Jerry Kent. Dr. Kent received her bachelor's at the College of William and Mary in both psychology and biology, and that joint focus is really evident in her work. She then went on to do a PhD at Indiana University with William Hetrick. She then went on to a postdoctoral position at the University of Minnesota, where she worked with Scott Sponheim. And her work has received funding from a variety of major agencies, the NSF, NIMH, as well as the Narset Foundation. And she investigates motor abnormalities and their expression within psychopathology, including psychosis. And over the course of her recent career, she's increasingly been exploring the relationship between motor abnormalities and really the level at the level of the brain linking to clinical phenomenology. So this puts her in the uh, realm of, of a lot of brain circuitry, notably the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. And I've, I've noted over the years that the cerebellum has often been the neglected area of the brain. And that will be the focus of a lot of her work uh, that she'll present today. And it turns out that cerebellum's involved in uh, so many aspects of our lives and um, how that may link to psychotic disorders is a really um, strong interest of Jerry's. She re represents a really exciting um, expansion within psychology at UT Dallas uh, toward uh, including a more clinical focus. So without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Jerry Kent. All right, looks like we're good to go. Um, Thank you, Dan, for that uh, terrific introduction. Um, and let me just say how delighted I am to be participating in the Frontiers Lecture Series uh, here at the Center for Brain Health. Uh, so let's jump right in. Okay, so to give a brief uh, roadmap of where we're going to be going today, um, I'm going to more broadly introduce you to my program of research investigating motor dysfunction in individuals with psychotic disorders. Next, as promised, I will be spending a lot of time talking about the cerebellum and my interest in investigating cerebellar abnormalities in individuals with psychotic disorders. Uh, we're going to take a quick detour, uh, uh, foreshadowed by Dan, uh, to talk about some of my work investigating uh, more basal ganglia-mediated motor behavior in this population. And finally, I'm going to briefly touch on uh, the exciting uh, emerging uh, transdiagnostic cerebellar abnormalities that we're seeing. Okay, so to dive in to introduce you to my program of research, um, I first want to cover uh, what are the, the core features of psychotic disorders. Um, so most folks think about symptoms like hallucinations and delusions. Um, those are present. Uh, we also think about negative symptoms in individuals with psychotic disorders. So these are symptoms like decreased emotion expression, decreased motivation, decreased social engagement. Um, and finally, we see impairments across a broad range of cognitive domains. So domains like working memory, executive function, cognitive control, et cetera. So uh, at various points today, I'm going to refer to the psychosis spectrum. Um, and that can actually mean a couple different things depending on context. So uh, sometimes we use the word, psychos the word psychosis spectrum to talk about uh, diagnoses you may have heard of, like schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder that are slightly different, but that share those core features um, that I just covered. 
Um, other times we talk about a psychosis spectrum in terms of genetic liability. Um, so if we think about biological first degree relatives, um, those individuals share half of their genetic material with their affected relative. And so we think of them as being on a spectrum of genetic liability for psychosis. Um, we can also think about a psychosis spectrum in terms of intermediate phenotypic expression. So there are various groups of folks who experience um, sub-threshold clinical symptoms, so symptoms that are similar in content, but lower in severity to those uh, psychotic symptoms that I just reviewed. So we can think about a psychosis spectrum in terms of phenotypic expression as well. Okay, so uh, to introduce you to uh, the broad area of motor abnormalities and psychosis, uh, we're going to start with some historical context. Um, this is best captured by a recent retrospective study by Ken Kendler, where Kendler looked at historical clinical accounts of psychotic disorders. Um, and he compared these historic clinical accounts to modern diagnostic criteria. What Kendler found was that abnormal movements were noted by almost all of these historical accounts, um, but were absent from modern diagnostic criteria. So I should note here that I'm talking about subtle motor abnormalities in posture, gesture, gait. Um, this is different than what we think of as catatonia, which is represented in modern diagnostic criteria. Also important to note here is the fact that these historical accounts uh, were created prior to the widespread use of antipsychotic medication, which can have motor side effects. So what Kendler is picking up on is the fact that there are motor abnormalities um, that have been observed that were not side effects of antipsychotic medication, which is how they're often thought about today. Okay, so that brings us to today where comparatively, uh, compared to other uh, areas in which people <laughs> pursue uh, research, there's a relative lack of uh, research investigating motor abnormalities. Um, so this is in part, uh, certainly <laughs> due in part to the exclusion from the psychiatric taxonomy that I just talked about. Um, these uh, diagnostic categories aren't necessarily meant to influence what exactly we study, but they often end up having that effect. Um, I think I mentioned also uh, the salience of um, motor side effects of antipsychotic medications. That was another reason where interest was diminished. Um, and also, um, you know, as there, there was an increasing awareness of these motor abnormalities that are present prior to antipsychotic treatment that uh, are, are not, not side effects, they were generally accounted for as an epiphenomenon. So as we began to appreciate the global neurodevelopmental abnormalities uh, in psychosis, the idea was like, well, sure, if there's that much going on, then yeah, you might expect some kind of subtle motor abnormalities. They weren't really seen as a core important feature of the disorder. Um, I obviously have a, a lot of reasons that I think the study of motor abnormalities is uh, exciting, and I'm going to uh, share those with you right now. Um, so there are actually uh, recent theories that posit that motor abnormalities are highly relevant to the pathophysiology of psychotic disorders. So what I mean by that is that uh, the same brain areas and neural circuits that are implicated in these motor abnormalities, it's thought that they might also be contributing to clinical symptoms. Um, there are often uh, psychological processes associated with motor abnormalities that can give us some uh, exciting clues about um, the psychological processes that may be uh, disrupted in this population. The other really powerful and interesting reason to study these motor abnormalities is that relative to the more higher order cognitive functions that folks often tend to focus on, the neural circuitry uh, related to these motor abnormalities is often more circumscribed um, than for uh, the neural circuitry underlying various cognitive functions. And so um, because it's more uh, circumscribed, we can actually get really um, kind of direct and powerful clues about uh, neural circuitry that's implicated in the clinical expression of these disorders which has the potential to eliminate potentially very potent treatment targets. Okay, so let's dive right in uh, to my work investigating cerebellar abnormalities. Um, so I'd like to start out by introducing you all to my good friend, the cerebellum. Um, essentially, uh, there are a couple uh, neural features of the cerebellum that are quite remarkable. So despite its relatively small size, 
the cerebellum contains approximately half of the brain's neurons. Um, in addition to just the sheer number of neurons, there's a really unique and uh, powerful arrangement of these neurons. So the main uh, cells in the cerebellum are arranged in a lattice formation, and this uh, perpendicular intersection affords just astronomical numbers of connections. So when we think about just the sheer number of um, the number of neurons and this particular way that they're arranged, uh, the cerebellum has uh, intense computational power. Now this particular cytoarchitectural structure that I just described is uniform throughout the entire cerebellum. Um, so it, it, this is just a really uh, elegant, uh, tem a really uh, powerful uh, part of the brain. So this is especially exciting to think about in the context of uh, reciprocal connectivity with other brain areas. Um, so as depicted schematically here, uh, in addition to receiving input from and sending input to uh, motor areas of the cortex, the cerebellum also receives information from and sends input back to higher order areas of the brain, including the prefrontal cortex. So when we think about um, this reciprocal connectivity in the context of that uh, unique cytoarchitectural uniformity and computational power, the exciting idea <laughs> emerges that the cerebellum may actually be performing the same computation on both motor and non-motor information. Um, and indeed, there is uh, empirical support for this idea that the cerebellum is involved in cognitive processes. So in studies that look at cerebellar neural activity during cognitive tasks, um, so these are fMRI studies where uh, cerebellar activity is examined during cognitive tasks that either don't involve or control for motor behavior. Um, the cerebellum is active uh, during a variety of cognitive, uh, domain, cognitive tasks, so domains like working memory, uh, executive function, even emotion processing, um, so there are data to support this idea. So the theoretical backdrop uh, for my work investigating cerebellar abnormalities in individuals with psychotic disorders can be traced back to Nancy Andreasen's theory of cognitive dysmetria. So this theory posits that cerebellar abnormalities contribute to a disruption in the fluid temporal coordination and sequencing, not just of motor information, but also of cognitive and affective information. And in this way, um, the cerebellum may be able, and abnormalities therein, may be able to account for not just the motor abnormalities that we see, but also some of the cardinal clinical symptoms of the disorder. Um, I should note here that uh, within the theory of cognitive dysmetria, the cerebellum is functioning as a part of one of those cerebellar cortical circuits. Um, so it's not like we're saying it's all in the cerebellum, <laughs> um, but it is a very important node uh, within uh, cortical, uh, cerebellar cortical circuits. Um, so uh, what I set out to do uh, is to test the hypothesis derived from this theory that there are uh, cerebellar abnormalities in individuals with psychotic disorders. And I first started doing this um, through looking at uh, behavioral assays of cerebellar function. So what that means is I'm looking at performance on tasks that we think are highly dependent on the integrity of the cerebellum. So the first task that I am going to talk to you about today like this is called postural sway. So what postural sway refers to is the idea that even when we're standing up quote unquote straight, um, we're always making minor adjustments to maintain that upright posture and the area over which those adjustments are made is what we call postural sway. So you can see here in this figure, also in this plot here, um, you can plot the movement of that center of gravity uh, over time. And you can see kind of that sway area phenomenon. Um, and so we can take the area of that postural uh, sway process. Um, and, and this is how we quantify postural sway. So um, the more area over which you're moving to maintain an upright posture, we would say that's a less efficient postural sway process. So 
um, we looked at this task in individuals with psychotic disorders and controls. Um, and over here, I've plotted that measure of sway area that we just talked about. Um, and we have a, a very robust uh, finding of increased postural sway in individuals with psychotic disorders. So this would be indicative of uh, cerebellar dysfunction. Okay, so um, in addition to looking at uh, behavioral tasks and in individuals with psychotic disorders, I've also had the opportunity to investigate cerebellar integrity in uh, groups that are at elevated genotypic or phenotypic risk for a psychotic disorder. So um, we've looked at another highly cerebellar task, idling conditioning, which I'll talk more about in a, in a bit, um, in biological first degree relatives. Um, and again, we see the behavioral impairment. So what this indicates is that cerebellar abnormalities are associated with that genetic liability for psychotic disorders. I've also had the opportunity to contribute to research examining cerebellar integrity in individuals at clinical high risk for psychotic disorders. So among, among other things, um, these groups uh, typically have uh, those attenuated symptoms that I talked about earlier. Um, and here again, we see the deficits on uh, cerebellar uh, tasks. So essentially what we're seeing here is that the cerebellar abnormality is also associated with this intermediate phenotypic expression. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's the presence of these abnormalities in this clinical high risk group gives us a hint that there might be something or there could be something there prognostically, but we'll have to wait for the prospective studies to see. Okay, um, so my work and the work of others has uh, yielded accruing behavioral evidence of cerebellar dysfunction. There's also quite a bit of evidence of cerebellar neural dysfunction, um, and this is through fMRI studies um, that are looking at cerebellar activation during a variety of tasks and comparing it in controls and a patient group. Um, sure enough, by and large, the overarching pattern is that there is less cerebellar neural activity in individuals with psychotic disorders. However, in um, almost all of this literature, um, these are sort of incidental findings insofar as the cerebellum wasn't the target of these tasks. Um, and as a result, given all that reciprocal connectivity, um, it's you're not able to say whether the decreased activation in the cerebellum is really due to uh, dysfunction in the cerebellum specifically, or whether it's an epiphenomenon of hypofunctioning in another reciprocally connected area of the brain. So for example, um, decreased activity in the frontal lobes. Um, so what I set out to do for my dissertation was to examine cerebellar neural function in individuals with psychotic disorders while the cerebellum was being directly recruited by an extremely cerebellar specific task. And I used the fine grained spatial resolution of fMRI for this. Okay, so what was that highly cerebellar task? Um, we used what's called delay eye blink conditioning. Um, so if you remember Pavlov's dogs, uh, this is sort of similar. What this entails is the pairing of a neutral stimulus, like a tone, um, that on its own does not elicit any particular response, with a stimulus, like an air puff to the corner of the eye, that naturally elicits a response. So this naturally elicits an eye blink. Um, so participants will obviously blink in response to the air puff, um, but with repeated presentation of um, the tone and the air puff, um, what happens is, and also I should state, it's really important that um, the air puff is, um, is co-terminating with the tone. So the tone starts and then the air puff comes in right at the end of the tone. So with repeated presentations with this uh, particular uh, temporal relationship, participants will go from blinking in response to the air puff to starting to blink prior to air puff presentation in response to the tone. And this eye blink activity that starts here, um, that is what we would call conditioning. So um, I could spend a lot of time <laughs> on this slide. Don't worry, I won't. Um, but, but I put it up here just to indicate to you that just decades of non-human animal research have exquisitely characterized uh, the circuitry that underlies this delay idling conditioning response. Um, it's 
basically the most cerebellar task we have. It's very specific to the cerebellum. It's translational across species. Um, and so we can be really confident that we're, we're using a really cerebellar task here. Okay, um, and sure enough, uh, a few years back, I reviewed the literature looking at uh, cerebellar, or looking at delay idling conditioning in individuals with psychotic disorders. And by and large, uh, we do see a pattern of a behavioral deficit um, in, in this population. So, so it's not just as the cerebellar task, um, but it's sensitive to the particular cerebellar abnormalities we're seeing in individuals with psychotic disorders. Okay, so how, how did we put this in the scanner? Um, so we actually had to create equipment that allowed us to conduct delay idling conditioning in the fMRI environment. Um, so you can see here, we fashioned uh, some swim goggles um, and you can see the air puff is delivered through uh, this rubber tube. So that's going to the corner of the eye. And then we've got an IR sensor, an infrared sensor here that allows us to track eye blink activity. And the way this works is as the eyelid closes, that infrared light is reflected back and uh, recorded by the sensor. And so we can see actually when an eye blink is occurring. Um, and so this, this gives us important information about the morphology of the eye blink and it lets us see when it starts, which is what we're really interested in for conditioning. Okay, so what was our fMRI experiment? Um, so what we did was we had two runs here, noted as run two and run three, where we presented 52 of those paired trials that I was describing earlier. Um, we also had a run at the beginning where we presented unpaired stimuli. Um, and so uh, the reason we did this was so we could subtract out the neural activity that was just associated with the tone or the air puff um, and really isolate the neural activity that was specific to conditioning. Okay, I should note, um, this was a pilot study, um, so our sample was pretty small. Um, so, you know, we would want to interpret these findings as, uh, as preliminary. Okay, so to remind you of our behavioral index here, uh, here's what we're looking at. So we're looking at how often someone is blinking or starts blinking, excuse me, in response to the tone prior to air puff presentation. So eye blink activity in here is what we would consider a conditioned response. So that's what we're looking for. Um, and the way that we look at conditioning over time is uh, we break up our approximately 100 paired trials into bins. So here I've got uh, one bin of 13 trials, and here's another one, uh, and so on and so forth, so that we can look at uh, what's happening over time over the course of the experiment. Um, so what we're then doing for each of those 13 trials here on the y-axis is we're saying, okay, um, so of those 13 trials, on how many of them do we see that condition response? Do we see that eye blink activity that starts in response to the tone prior to air puff presentation? Uh, and then we graph the, the percent of those trials where we see that activity. Okay, um, so here's what we see. Um, so essentially in our control group, we're seeing a, a slow and steady um, acquisition of the conditioned response um, over the course of the experiment. Um, our patient group actually starts out looking pretty similar um, and then does not go on to increase uh, the acquisition of the conditioned response. So this is a significant group by block interaction. Um, it's a really small sample size, but it's sort of roughly what we would expect. Um, our patient group is not continuing to acquire the conditioned response at the same rate as the control group. Okay, so let's look at our imaging findings. Um, so the results I'm going to present here are looking at uh, cerebellar, or sorry, looking at neural activity uh, during the first half of those paired trials. And the cerebellum is working really hard to try to acquire that uh, condition response. Um, so we're looking at neural activity here and we're subtracting out the neural activity um, that is just associated with the stimuli by themselves. Um, so what we see in our control group for that contrast um, is a significant cluster of activation in the cerebellum. Um, so uh, this, this cluster is uh, notable for a few reasons. Um, so first, uh, this cluster overlaps with the deep nuclei. So um, that is the area of the cerebellum that we know is most important in the acquisition of the conditioned response. So it's very exciting to us um, that that is emerging <laughs> uh, as significant activation in controls. 
Um, it's sort of a small cluster, but that's actually kind of what we would expect given just such the specific neural circuit that we're trying to recruit here. Um, the other thing is I should note, this is a whole brain FWE corrected analysis. Um, so essentially the neural activity you're seeing is very specific to the cerebellum um, and it survived a very stringent statistical correction. So we're very excited about this. Um, when we look at the same contrast in our patient group, we do not see significant cerebellar activation. I should note, we actually didn't see any activation that survived stringent statistical correction. Um, so, you know, we want to be a little bit careful about whether this is a power issue. Um, and the group difference did not survive stringent statistical correction. Um, but by and large, this is roughly consistent with the idea that the cerebellum is not performing as well um, in our patient group when it is directly called upon to, to do what it uh, to do this very cerebellar task. OK, so the other uh, thing that we looked at here was we looked at the relationship of neural activity in the cerebellum um, during this uh, initial conditioning phase as it related to negative symptoms. So again, these are symptoms like decreased expression, decreased social engagement, um, et cetera. We chose negative symptoms specifically um, because there's some there are some hints in the literature that these types of symptoms are more often correlated with motor abnormalities and other types. Um, and that, that may be due, due to the fact that they fluctuate less um, than something like a hallucination or delusion type symptom. So anyway, that's something we're looking at here. Um, and I should also note that this was a cerebellar specific analysis. So we're just looking at the cerebellum. So what we find here, are two clusters in the cerebellum that are um, significantly associated with negative symptoms such that the more activity there was uh, in these brain areas during that early conditioning phase, uh, the less lesser severity of the negative symptoms. Um, so this is this is very interesting to us uh, for a few reasons. Um, the first reason is this cluster that I'm highlighting here seems to overlap with the deep nuclei. So the fact that in our patient group, there's some variability as a function of this clinical variable, um, you know, that could give us a hint as to maybe why that group difference didn't uh, remain significant. The other cluster that was significantly associated um, was in a lobule called CRIS-1 that has extensive uh, prefrontal connectivity. Um, and so it makes good sense to us that the area of the cerebellum, um, the degree to which it's able to be activated during this very cerebellar task, uh, being associated with fewer negative symptoms, like this makes sense to us because this would be an area um, that has some connection with the frontal areas that would be involved in instantiating that kind of symptom. Okay, so just to recap what we covered, um, we saw evidence of uh, robust evidence of cerebellar activation and controls during this highly cerebellar task, but we did not see this in our patient group. What we did see was the degree to which the cerebellum was able to be recruited um, during this highly cerebellar task was inversely related to the severity of negative symptoms. So the better the cerebellum did, uh, the less severe the negative symptoms were. Um, and this is consistent with the theory of cognitive dysmetria, which I presented earlier. OK, so let's take a minute um, and I will summarize what I've covered so far in terms of my research investigating uh, the integrity of the cerebellum in the psychosis spectrum. Um, so I have used both fMRI and behavioral measures uh, to do this. Um, and we look and when we look at the work I've done uh, in patients, um, we have evidence of cerebellar abnormalities using both behavioral tasks uh, and on a neural level using fMRI. I've also been involved with a few studies in um, populations at elevated genotypic or phenotypic risk um, for psychotic disorders. And um, those studies also uh, indicated uh, abnormalities as assayed by these behavioral probes of cerebellar function. Okay, so uh, we're going to take a detour now. Um, <laughs> we're going to uh, move up to the basal ganglia. So it's a different uh, brain area, but the, the principle is the same. So we're, we're, we're looking at a motor behavior that we think is related to uh, some neural areas that are also important for clinical expression.
OK, so the particular motor behavior that I'm going to talk about next is uh, movement fluidity. So we're talking about voluntary movement here, um, and specifically I'm talking about a handwriting task. So you can think about the fluidity of uh, the kind of stroke you would be making in that context. Um, so when there is disruption in the fluidity of voluntary movement, um, that's believed to be related to problems in the basal ganglia. Specifically, uh, striatal hyperdopaminergia has been uh, posited as a possible uh, specific mechanism for this. Um, this is very interesting to me as a, a psychosis researcher um, because uh, dopamine-centric theories of psychosis, which have been very influential, implicate striatal hyperdopaminergia specifically as a key mechanism, um, specifically involved in uh, symptoms like hallucinations and delusions through uh, this phenomenon of aberrant salience. So thinking that things are related to you and maybe they aren't, thinking that there are connections between things when maybe there aren't. Um, so you can see how that's highly relevant to the phenomenology here, the clinical phenomenology. Um, so interestingly, disfluency has been documented in individuals at clinical high risk for psychotic disorders. So what I set out to study um, is to examine whether there was evidence of disfluent movement in biological first-degree relatives of individuals with psychotic disorders. So investigating whether uh, disfluent movement is associated with genetic liability for the psychotic disorder. OK, so we did this uh, through a handwriting task. So we had participants provide handwriting samples of cursive L's and cursive E's uh, using a tablet uh, and a non-inking pen. Um, and essentially what we're looking at is we're looking at fluidity uh, within a vertical stroke. So to show you what I mean here, you can see uh, there's one. And then we come back down, that's another vertical stroke and so on and so forth. So that's where we're looking for fluidity. Um, the way we quantify movement fluidity is through a value called jerk. So jerk is the third time derivative. So in much the same way that acceleration is the change in velocity over time, jerk is the change in acceleration over time. So if you think about a movement where there's lots of changes in acceleration, that's not going to be a very smooth movement. Um, and then we average this across those strokes that I was pointing out earlier. OK, so to look at an example here, um, you can see even in these you know, handwriting examples, uh, a low jerk handwriting sample just looks smoother than the high jerk sample down here. Like You can kind of see what we're talking about with this disfluency. All right, so um, the, the main focus of the study was on our biological relatives. Um, we also had a patient group for comparison. Um, and we're looking at this jerk value. So the y-axis here is a little difficult to, to make a lot of sense of, um, in part because we the, the data were not normally distributed, so we log transformed them. Uh, jerk is also normalized to stroke length, and so it's unitless. <laughs> um, so essentially, the important thing to look at here is that a higher value is more jerk, uh, more disfluency, a less fluid movement. Um, so we see a very robust effect in our patient group, and what I would call a robust lack of effect uh, in our relative group. I mean, they are just exactly the same essentially as our control group. Um, and so this is in contrast to what I was talking about earlier with the cerebellum. Um, so in this context, uh, this particular motor abnormality is not associated with the genetic liability for psychotic disorders. Um, so, you know, as we, we were thinking through these results and trying to make sense of them, um, we noticed that this was a strikingly asymptomatic relative sample. So um, you might expect a relative sample to have uh, elevations in those attenuated subclinical uh, type symptoms that I was talking about earlier compared to a control group, but these relatives did not have that at all. They were basically similar to controls in terms of subthreshold clinical expression. And so when we're thinking about the potential mechanism uh, here, uh, perhaps it makes sense that we're not seeing any kind of motor abnormality um, when there isn't uh, any kind of um, subclinical symptom expression, given the close tie between the hypothesized mechanism here and uh, really key uh, and very specific uh, psychosis symptoms.
OK, so the last thing um, that I will leave you with today um, is just just some uh, just a quick note about uh, some emerging um, some emerging things in the field here that I am starting to get more interested in. So um, the cerebellar abnormalities, uh, I've been studying cerebellar abnormalities in individuals with psychotic disorders. They are not only found in this population. Um, there are other clinical populations. So, for example, um, this is an exhaustive list, but autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, dyslexia, that also demonstrate cerebellar abnormalities. Um, and so this is exciting for a number of reasons. Uh, this is really kind of in line with NIMH's move towards transdiagnostic uh, uh, processes and biomarkers uh, as espoused in their uh, research domain criteria and specifically exciting in that context given the recent addition of a sensory motor domain to the RDoC matrix. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, really exciting work to be done here and I'm excited to uh, start learning about it more and moving in that direction. And with that, I want to thank my uh, terrific mentors. Uh, the work that I presented today was uh, done during my graduate training and on my postdoctoral fellowship. So I want to acknowledge Bill Hedrick and Scott Sponheim, um, some of the main co-authors from some of the studies I shared today, as well as our funding sources, of course. Um, and thank you for your attention. And I would be delighted to answer questions. Thank you. Okay, Jerry. Well, um, thank you very much for the uh, talk, and uh, we, we'll now move to the the question session at this point. Um, I'll I'll start us off by asking for a little bit more clarification on the cerebellar imaging work that seems very exciting, especially to find activation that overlaps with the nuclei. And I wonder if there's any um, you know novel ways of getting higher resolution if you're specifically interested in cerebellar scanning given given you kind of have to correct overly with the whole brain i wonder if you could possibly get greater resolution either statistically or or even morphologically um, in the future yeah, I am so glad you asked that question. There's actually a lot of layers there. Um, and I think perhaps you picked up on some of my language where I said it appears to overlap and it looks like um, because essentially this study, you know, we we're interested in kind of what was going on in the whole brain. Um, this is you can acquire a conditioned response, interestingly enough, without a cortex. If you lopped it off, you can still acquire it. Um, but we thought you know, given uh, that this is happening in humans, like there might be some other network activity that would be interesting to us. Um, so the study, this study was not designed specifically to optimize uh, cerebellar resolution statistically or in terms of the imaging. So um, yeah, so that's a great, a great point um, and certainly something we try to be careful about. Um, but so, okay, so to answer your question though directly, there are a few things. Um, Given the small size uh, of the deep nuclei, you know, more resolution is always going to be better, um, it, it, just kind of broadly speaking. So that would be good. The other thing you have to think about is the spatial smoothing. Um, you know, we apply a smoothing to the whole brain and that's fine in the cortex, but things really start to blur a little bit in the cerebellum. So like the ideal way to do that would be to apply a separate filter um, to the cerebellum and also to do separate spatial normalization for the cerebellum. Um, so like the suit cerebellar atlas is really good for that. At the time we did the studies, there were some complexities with like kind of Frankensteining the brain. So we just kind of committed and went for it. Um, we also were really nervous about the Eklund paper that had come out with statistical thresholding. So we wanted to be like, all right, whole brain FWE, no, no funny business. Um, but I do think there's an argument, like you're saying, just the sheer number of voxels that are <laughs> you have to correct for in the cortex uh, to start thinking about stringent ways to do a cluster correction. So that's what we try to do in our symptom analysis. Um, so I hope that kind of answers the questions about the the kinds of ideas that we had and kind of how you would sort of optimally go about that. It's a good question. OK, um, let's go ahead and move to another question from the audience uh, regarding the rocking posture. I, the question really is how reliable of a signal would that be as a as a mental health marker, I suppose is the way to put it. Mm 
Oh boy. Well, I mean, that's the that's the million dollar question. Um, I mean, that's a little bit hard to answer because on the one hand, it is a, a robust effect. Um, I mean, when you're looking at these data, and this this question always comes up, so I'll just go there, and then someone else can continue the the path. But you know, we always have a lot of concerns with medication side effects. Um, so part of why I so I'm taking a little detour here, I'll, I'll circle back. But part of why I glossed over the patient sample in the handwriting study was that like that is literally the same motor abnormality that is also instantiated uh, as a result of antipsychotic medication side effects. So it is, it is there spontaneously before antipsychotic medication, but once folks are on it, there's just no possible way to disentangle the uh, etiology of that motor dysfunction. So, you know, and in the case of the handwriting study, like we're very nervous and we don't want to say anything about like the source of that disfluency. In the context of something like postural sway, I mean, obviously antipsychotic medication is a blunt instrument, like it's affecting the brain, but it's it's less like directly tied like to the brain area and the process that we're studying. So like in that case, we just do a really good job of like monitoring participants while they're doing the task to make sure there aren't any abnormal side effect movements that would inflate it. Um, we also, you know, make sure that the, the folks who were running on the study like don't have any visible side effects, period. Um, so we're careful, but like that is a complexity when you're talking about a biomarker. Like, you know, I get real, I would get real worried about like making too many, um, like that kind of like marker, or what was the word used? Like class, like diagnostic classifier or something. I, I would just, there are some complexities that we have to be careful of. Um, so like there are some complexities there. Um, that's part of why I'm so um, interested in uh, these kind of higher risk populations that carry some of the genetic liability or that are experiencing attenuated symptoms, but mostly haven't been through treatment. The other thing is we just don't know about this idea of specificity yet. Um, so I'm, I'm telling you, like there are these hints that this this is also happening in other populations. So like there's this question of specificity there where we don't want to say like, oh, it's for psychosis when oh, I forget which one it has actual postural sway data. But like maybe it's ADHD. There's also been like a literal postural sway study. So there's those kinds of considerations too. It's a great question. Right. Um, th there's probably two interrelated follow-ups that I'll try to combine into one question here for you. Just on that same topic, um, it, this is hard to do without a big sample size, but uh, the question is, could could some of those posture differences or motor differences maybe um, correlate or be found to correlate with severity levels in psychosis, which would kind of make them a, you know, a more robust marker? Uh, that's kind of question one. And then this very related to what you just said, uh, one of the audience members mentions there's a, the Apple Health app has something called walking asymmetry or double support time, which one could look at and is there potential for some kind of digital health solution that would, would maybe be a sensitive marker that wasn't designed for that, but one could imagine that that could maybe provide something more in the clinical picture. Oh boy. Okay, those are great questions. I reserve the right to ask you to remind me of all the components if I if I lose track while I'm answering. Um, so you know, I didn't get a chance to get into this, um, but we do see clinical correlates. Um, so like obviously that was part of our imaging analysis. Um, but in the postural sway study, we found correlates. I think with a kind of general a general index of psychopathology within like a psychotic symptom assessment. Um, so, you know, there are hints there that this is tracking with symptom severity. We're very excited about it, but, you know, we do get a little nervous about the sample sizes and then you're running correlations. There's a different correlation for each type of symptom. We had different conditions that I kind of collapsed just for the purpose of demonstration. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's there's something there, but we like to be really careful. Um, but yeah, absolutely. That relationship and shared variance with clinical severity is definitely like the, the key in terms of like you know the support to this theory of cognitive dysmetria. Thinking about kind of mobile assessment, um, you know, it's actually I was talking about this with some of my colleagues. Um, like, we're, there's a pretty small group of us that study motor dysfunction um, in the psychosis spectrum, and initially. Um, it was, I think the vendors, like the phone people were really nervous about us trying to make apps. Cause like, 
one of the things we study, I'm just going to use my phone as an example, is like the application of like constant pressure. And so sometimes folks get worried about like hurting the phone <laughs> through our measures. Um, but I, I do see what you're saying, how there, there is more of a, an opportunity there with posture and gait. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, a great way to look at it. I think it's innovative and I think you get a lot of data that way, like a real long time series. But again, I think you're going to have to get like a prospective study to kind of really understand what's going on because you're always going to have that medication confound. Um, yeah, so I guess that's kind of where I would land on that. And then um, another comment um, is again, like this idea of specificity, like, and that's why I'm so excited about this kind of R doc direction, like understanding like, what does it mean when these two different clinical expressions share a particular abnormality? Um, and I think that's going to be really important to think very clearly about as we're trying to make statements about biomarkers. These are really good questions. <laughs> okay, um, another question more at the neural circuit level. Um, a uh, great talk. Uh, did you observe any differences in cerebellar volume uh, between groups, notably the control and psychosis? And then secondly, you had mentioned prefrontal cortex to cerebellar connectivity could be relevant here and whether you had assessed um, that type of connectivity using the fMRI. Yeah, these are great questions. So we did not look at um, any of those things in this study. So this is just my dissertation. So it was like pretty focused. People have looked at that though. Um, so in terms of volume metrics, um, and the work I'm thinking of is, is earlier work that um, you know didn't necessarily capitalize on these like cerebellar specific uh, spatial normalization techniques. So you know, like just bear that in mind. But I believe what has been found in terms of volumetrics is a general pattern, and this is actually like what you see a lot when you start to look across a bunch of different studies, a general pattern of decreased volume, but also sometimes increased volume. Um, so, you know, it's, it's there. Um, the signal seems to be there. In terms of uh, connectivity, I, um, so, so there, there are data out there suggesting that, um, I believe um, that there are differences in the structural connectivity, so like using DTI, and in functional connectivity, so just looking at functional networks. I think that's at rest, at rest and during tasks. So there are data to support that, um, and those are those are there. You know, when I was doing my dissertation, we just we really wanted to like look at what was happening in the cerebellum while it was being like called upon <laughs> to, to to be the cerebellum. Um, so it's sort of like the, the broader context. OK, yeah, no, th those are part of the picture, but maybe never definitive given how complicated and individually variable brains are. Um, here's a question regarding um, not so much the diagnostic tools, but whether they serve as markers for therapeutic response. I, I, I suppose you've already gotten into some of, some of the medication complexities, but um, are, are any of the maybe the gait or posture or fine motor or imaging um, something that could help to be used clinically maybe to, to mark uh, to track improvement? Oh boy, that's a great question. I mean, so I will acknowledge I am now sort of out of my wheelhouse here. So, um, you know, I'm doing my best, but I don't claim to have the same level of expertise talking about this as the previous questions. Um, you know, I, it really depends on the target. So in the context of the cerebellum, I'm not aware of any treatments, current like actual treatments that specifically target the cerebellum. Um, it's not to say that that's impossible. So a study that, that uh, my grad mentor did before my time uh, actually was able to administer um, secretin. There's a chemical that, that they, they thought would act on the cerebellum and it had an effect on eye blink conditioning. So it's not to say that there aren't targets there. Um, but, um, you know, I, I'm not personally aware of any pharmacological targets that specifically target the cerebellum not to say that it couldn't be there. Um, just a brief aside before I segue into the basal ganglia, um, the cerebellum is also very rich in endogenous cannabinoid receptors. Um, and so 
Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with this type of work, so I, I don't want to say like one way or the other, um, uh, you know, whether that uh, would be a good target. Um, we know, in fact, that, you know, cannabinoids are very harmful if you're at elevated risk for psychosis. Um, but, but the cerebellum does have interesting targets, I guess, is all I want to say there. Um, okay, now that's in contrast to the basal ganglia. Um, which is like the literal site of action for antipsychotic medications. Um, you know, it's uh, working on, well, maybe I shouldn't say that since I haven't taken my neuropharmacology class too recently, but like it is acting in that similar area in that neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, in that case, like absolutely like that, that's the treatment target, um, you know, and then the problem is that it affects all this other stuff. Um, right, so I hope, hope that helps. <laughs> Okay, um, let's go ahead and I'm gonna see if I can combine a few of these other questions. Uh, there's a lot of interest in TBI, stroke, and, and other disorders. So maybe just if you could elaborate on the final part of your talk where you had suggested some of these techniques could be applied to other disorders, maybe to make it a little more specific. Um, this is like a psych psychiatric population you've talked about, but clearly it could be maybe done neurologically and maybe maybe one of the most promising uh, avenues that you could see for your work uh, extending into either psych further psychiatric or neurological disorders. Yeah, so I'm delighted to have the opportunity to, to address this. Um, what I want to specifically talk about is uh, the uh, stroke research that's been done. So actually, um, I, I didn't uh, I didn't cover this today, but some of the earliest clues about what's going on uh, were through uh, Jeffrey Schmaman's work uh, on individuals with cerebellar strokes. Um, and what Schmaman uh, saw was that uh, these stroke patients had a really strikingly similar clinical profiles as like some of the symptoms I've been talking about today. So uh, cognitive impairments, dysregulated emotion. Um, I mean, it, it, I think that he termed it the clinical cerebellar, cognitive cerebellar effective sym symptom or sy syndrome or something like that. Um, and so like that was actually like one of our first clues. Um, and so like absolutely like we see like very relevant analogs uh, in a neurological population. Um, you know, it's, it's a really interesting question though, because, um, you know, like obviously if there's this catastrophic event in the cerebellum, you know, we do see these really striking cognitive and affective symptoms, but you know, every so often you see a case of someone who is just like born without a cerebellum and that person is fine by and large. And so, you know, <laughs> just just to say, like, there's a lot of like kind of developmental factors going in here too. Um, so, anyway, I just I find that work really fascinating. So, yeah, like, absolutely, this is something that we would expect to see to varying degrees of similarity, depending on the specific pathology and the specific population. Um, but yeah, it, it has like really interesting transdiagnostic potential. Fantastic. Okay, um, maybe w another question, very related actually, is kind of going the other direction rather than trying to, uh, re you know, look at other conditions. W this is, I guess, related to sample size questions and heterogeneity of of people. Um, how much of your effort is is geared toward you know, replicating or confirming your findings versus extending them and this is kind of a question for the the research community as well as your own lab. How much do you do you sort of imagine you would devote to um, more of the replication than the extension? Yeah, this is an outstanding question and something that I I try to consider very carefully, as I hope was evidenced by some of my more measured language. Um, so I, I'm thrilled to have this question because I actually had a, a an amazing opportunity as a postdoc to work on the human connectome project. Um, grant that is specifically focused on psychotic disorders. 
Um, and through that grant, I was actually able to, in addition to all of our state-of-the-art cutting-edge neural measures, so we'll have resting state, DTI, et cetera, um, so I'll be able to look at um, not my work specifically, but you know some of those neural indices. Um, we also have a balanced data in that data set, and that'll be a huge sample. Um, so that is one very concrete step that I'm in the middle of in terms of investigating replicability um, and you know what kind of what shakes out at a larger sample. Um, and that really actually is what we're interested in. And you know, we call it the Psychosis Human Connectome Project. We want to see, are there different clusters based on clinical expression that uh, sort of differentiate in terms of behavioral performance or neural indices? Those are exactly the types of questions I'm interested in and am actively pursuing. OK, excellent. So um, we're at about that time to wrap up. So in conclusion, let's thank Dr. Jerry Kent for this um, enlightening talk on all things cerebellum and mental health, so many directions to go. Uh, and we welcome her to UT Dallas particularly. Make sure to say hello to her. If you're in Green Hall or uh, at the Brain Health Imaging Center, you'll likely uh, see her one of those places very soon. Um, to, just in conclusion, lifelong brain health is our shared mission. And the power of research really lies in how we use it to make the world a better place. With that, we've launched a large scale landmark study called the Brain Health Project, which will help people everywhere become proactive about maintaining and improving their brain's health and performance. If you're interested in learning more about the Brain Health Project and possibly participating, please scan the QR code shown on the screen now with your phone, or go ahead and visit thebrainhealthproject.org. That's T-H-E-B-R-A-I-N-H-E-L-T-H project.org. If you're interested in CEU credits for these talks, please visit centerforbrainhealth.org slash CEU. That's centerforbrainhealth.org slash CEU. And thank you for joining uh, virtually. And we look forward to uh, your attendance at our next talk, which is actually next week on Thursday, November 4th, where Dr. Sid O'Brien from the UNT Health Science Center will talk about Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And we also do have an in-person component for that talk that actually happens at the center. So we look forward to talking to you then. Thank you. We work, we live innovate and create at the center of it all is your brain health the ability to solve problems think analytically share empathy and thrive we're trying to make brain performance really the next fitness revolution so how do you boost brain power Welcome to the Brain Health Project, an urgent call to transform your mind to work stronger and faster. This is an absolute crisis as great as any we have ever faced. We have to equip the minds and brains of our citizens to cope with the accelerating, dizzying rate of change that they face in their lives. Your brain health is not fixed. Scientific discoveries prove it can adapt and grow regardless of your starting point. Our greatest value, the asset that will help us to change everything, every problem we're in, is all in our head. To harness that treasure, we must measure and monitor progress while things are going well versus waiting for an injury or disease to strike. Too many of us are outliving our brains, and that does not have to be the case. The information age is bombarding us with more content than our human brains can handle. How do you keep from getting lost in this and focus on deep thinking? For starters, stop multitasking. Science shows us that multitasking is bad for your brain. It reduces fluid intelligence, causes brain atrophy, and increases chronic stress. The global pandemic is creating more stress than ever. Stress that leads to depression and anxiety and beyond. Unlocking our potential to navigate these hurdles starts with learning the right strategies, even in school. So when teachers have these strategies, they're empowered to support our learners, and then the learners are now able to take ownership of their learning. Training kids how to think is doubling academic achievement among middle schoolers. I think the greatest national security threat is pre-K through 12. 
if we don't take care of educating our young men and women, then we have to ask ourselves, where, where are we going to be in 20 years? Our world-renowned scientists know you can increase your brain health, not lose it. It's time for a new category of health, brain health. You are a game changer. Ready to transform the world with us? Be a part of the brain health revolution. It starts 